I promise you, if you're listening right now and you think somebody else's winnings are coming out of your pocket, you've lost before you start. I promise you, it is the fakest thing in the world. It's the boogeyman. And it's also, unfortunately, the trait that is actually limiting you. I'm gonna throw my definition of stoicism at you because I think it aligns with how you see the world even though I know you don't identify with a Stoic, but you, 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 you hit me back with what that means to you. Okay. Right, so my definition of Stoicism is that we don't control what happens, but we control how we respond to what happens. I believe in that tremendously. Look, I'm, I'm, here's, my, here's my relationship with Stoicism. You, and for a while now, especially when I started to evolve and really start opening up of like how I thought, it's in my comments, it's in my DMs, Maybe because of you, or maybe not, I'm trying to remember, but somewhere in the ballpark of five, seven years ago, four years ago, I, and you know, we had the podcast when you were on mine, and we're probably repeating some stuff because I don't, rem- like, this is what I, but it's fun. I looked at the definition, like, just literally Googled it. Yeah. And I was like, oh, yeah. Like, a lot of it resonated. Um, the main reason I'm not going deeper into it is, I don't want to fuck up what's working for me. Sure. And I don't want to become almost like a caricature. I don't want to force it. So it's kind of why I stay away from a lot of stuff. You seem like a very intuitive guy. I am. And uh, so I could imagine sort of overthinking it. Inserting new stuff might mess up the intuition or the, the vibe. Something that I'm really grateful for was I actively could feel my career evolving and remember vividly promising myself that I would never say anything I didn't believe. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of almost like I didn't want to become the Fonz or or become Urkel. The catchphrase kind Uh of thing? I remember vividly thinking, I will never say crush it if it doesn't naturally come to me. I will never say anything. The one that's really probably funny to people, and I think people may or may, it'll be interesting to see how people, how this lands for some people. I never curse unless it naturally comes from me. Like I don't go and say like, oh, I've got to do my cursing thing. I play every audience different. D-Rock and I were just talking. I spoke this morning in Orlando and it was a very conservative B2B. And like, he was like, you were more scholarly. And I was like, I, some of the stuff that a lot of people know in my content would have not landed. Sure. What I did in Edmonton, the other day for 10,000 people would have not landed for these 400 people in any shape or form. And for me, I think what makes anybody who's putting out content effective is the humility to be contextual to the audience, not what they're interested in. You probably don't remember this, but the first time I met you, this would have been 2008. I was walking to the convention center at South South by Southwest. And uh, I was like, oh, it's Gary Vee. How how are you, Gary? And you're like, I'm good. I'm like, what's going on? You're like, just crushing it. (laughs) <laughs> and it was before the book. So the book came out, I was like, there, there it, is. it is. Yeah, like I, you know, I react to what I'm feeling more than kind of the reverse, sure. right? Like every, like if people listen carefully, it was all there before it came out. Yeah. Even V-Friends, you know, V-Friends, I talked at nausea around intellectual property. Refer- my office itself yeah. is a visualization of what was coming. I like that. I like that it's kind of like, I always talk about I'm a smoke and then there's fire. Mm -hmm. I'm proud of that because I feel like it's authentic. I feel like it, the, the, you know, one, I don't have the audacity to ever think that people should do the homework on me that allows you to kind of see it. Yeah. Like when people are like, don't you struggle with being misunderstood? I'm like, how, why would somebody who decides to see one clip on Instagram and I'm being me and in certain formats, I know exactly what that is. That's going to rub certain people the wrong way why should they spend 16 hours to know the full me? They shouldn't. And so I'm very empathetic to it. Um, And and that's kind of just how I see it. All right. So the new book is 12 and a half, we call them virtues or traits Mm -hmm. or ideas. Uh, Stoicism is supposed to be four. Okay. So I'm going to give you the four of stoicism and you tell me where they fit, how they work with the the 12 and a half. All right. So courage, temperance, which is like moderation, self-discipline. Interesting. uh, Justice and wisdom. Yeah. You know, I think it's interesting. I I think that those wisdom was one I actually wisdom is something I'm very interested in. Um 
I, I, I feel like I'm getting trapped into like affirmation that I have. Uh, by the way, I would love to be a stoic on the record or not. Like I'm just very flow. I that just way. want to riff on the idea. No, I fucking yeah. love this yeah. shit. I'm obsessed with wisdom. Yeah. So of here's a very interesting part about me. When I was five, six, seven, four, I, four, five, four, five, six, I would go outside in Queens. You know, I always talk about Edison, Jersey, but my first couple years in America were in Queens. And I would immediately, as a four year old child, run towards the 80 year old altar cockers, which is a good Yiddish word for old fuckers. And I would hold court and jam. And my mom, when I was 11, 13, 15, would tell me these stories of me. And she would talk about like the three or four or two guys that were like the grumps of the grumps. They would sit on this stoop and they would just make fun of everybody, be mean to everybody, hate everybody. But every morning, she would say that the occasional mornings where I didn't come outside, they'd be mad at her that she wasn't walking me at 7.30 in the morning. And it, she would just kind of talk about like what I was bringing to them. Yeah. And I remember even then, 15, when you're not really thinking about massive thoughtfulness, wisdom, I remember one time in my high school years, she, again, telling me a story that I've heard a couple times, and I just remember saying to myself, I was driving to high school, uh, no, mom, they were giving, they were giving to me. Yeah, of course. And so I'm very fascinated by wisdom. I, I'm very fascinated by us not tapping into the resource that is 80 and 90 year olds. Those are the entrepreneurs I love, like the, the people you've never heard of. And then you get talking to them and they're like, oh, he had this whole string of uh, like air conditioning supplying Correct. company, some company you've never heard of. He had 400 employees, you know, and, and uh, he just figured out some you niche. Want, you want to hear uh, something that I know that my team and nobody's ever heard. I did say it's somewhere, but I don't know where. That person is the reason this book exists. Let me really? explain. I was somewhere and I'm struggling to recall, but it was an 85, I was there for something, and I don't remember. Maybe family, maybe a keynote or business. But it was one of these, kind of like where we were today, like a country club, a hotel, like a big thing. And somebody was having an 85th birthday party. Right. And there were so many people there, they were all wearing these t-shirts, and I do what I normally do. I was listening. <laughs> Not on some Yenta stuff, contextualizing. And the punchline of this, not to go too long-winded, was there were grand, there were 22 year olds talking to 60 year olds saying, my grandfather worked for Joe and he's the reason our family did this. I just remember vividly, I'm even getting weirdly emotional right now, thinking this is what the world does not talk about with business, that it is absolutely just as easy to build an empire, and, and the, I'm, I'm going pretty fast. Not only was he 85, not only did all these people travel, all these people, sure. I think it might have been Arizona, I'm trying to remember, from like, people were like, I'm from Chicago, for his 85th birthday, that kind of lightly knew him because of the legacy he left as an entrepreneur having this company that put people on. I remember saying to myself, that's gonna be me. I remember thinking, this is something that needs to be talked about because even then, this was like seven or eight, five, seven, eight years ago, business was misunderstood. And now, as our country divides even more, capitalism, business, like it, there's like a blanket demonization sure. that I think is wildly misunderstood. Not on some like the money rule, like more on actually like you just can be kind yeah. and build an empire. Well, that's like multi-generational impact. And then imagine if you could go see the actual community where he employed all those people. 100. Like this store on this main street here, like businesses have, look at the towns that have been totally revitalized because somebody moves something and, somewhere. And my point is, I think that's accepted. Yeah. Like people like Detroit did this because that's business, business, business. For me, the impact was the humanity. Sure. That you can use business as a format to touch tens, hundreds, if not millions of people done right. And I think there's a way to do it. I really, you know, and I used to say this back to smoke and fire. There's a lot of content on me and the internet saying things like, I don't want Steve Jobs legacy because I don't like the way he treated employees right. or the narrative that people followed. Sure. Whether he did or not, it became the narrative. I think this is the culmination of that. This is me putting a flag in the ground and saying, listen, the alpha way to win, like sustained way to win is actually grounded in kindness, in gratitude, in empathy, in accountability, and 
we can get there. I've done it. I've seen lots of other people do it. And I actually think in a world where Gen Z is gonna have ridiculous amounts of options, you know, everyone's talking about the great resignation. The great resignation isn't because the government's subsidizing, it's because people have options. Right. You can make $85,000 a year on TikTok. Well, and don't you think the ultimate thing to have someone say about you is like, oh, he or she was very successful, very good at what they were doing, and they weren't a piece of shit? It's my number one. Yeah. It's my number one. It's the only thing I think about. But it's harder to measure, right? This is what you talk about a little bit in the book. It's so much harder to measure. Like, how do you know day to day that you're getting there? You know, it's funny. You, I know that. And then something hit me this week. This week, Bobby Glennon and Shirley uh, had their 10th anniversary at Vayner. And, and Tyler had his eighth. And DeMeo, who now works at Vayner Sports, had his ninth. And uh, Maribel tweeted out yesterday because I was on the Today Show and it was a good, it was kind of like, sometimes it just hit. It was like a good one for me. It was like, this is really what I'm saying. She said, for all the people that have been asking me why I've worked for this guy for seven years in an industry that has 30% toner, turnover every year, this. And you're right, it's not easy to measure, but in the macro, it's very easy to measure in a 15 year window, it's called retention. Right, <laughs> well, if, to go to the great resignation, people aren't quitting jobs that they love. They're quitting jobs that were very well paid and, or... And my argument is when we clip this video in five years, people are gonna be quitting jobs that they like a lot. It's just a game of options. Sure. And I think the long... So we saw it with the long tail of influencers. My first book, the only other one I felt like this about, um, aka I think it's just gonna be successful because it's gonna hit a chord. The argument I made in 2008 was the long tail of YouTube, for all intents and purposes, was gonna be lucrative. And the, if you go right now on Amazon and sort my reviews, people shit on me saying, yeah, 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 we're gonna make $80,000 talking about lipstick or honey on YouTube. And it, and it happened greater than I predicted. I think that's gonna happen with NFTs. I think about all the people that have been art directors for VaynerMedia making 80 to 150,000 a year. A third of those never make it into the door because they're going to sell their NFTs in 2031. Huh. I think that the world continues to build technologies in server base, whether centralized or decentralized, that continue to create options for the human. And I think that's going to play out. So to your point, right now that's the case. I argue that you better get on board to what I'm talking about here because you're going to need to be remarkable to win the supply and demand game of of this. Epictetus said that philosophy wasn't this dry, abstract thing. It was a thing he said you should be talking about, writing down, reading about, exploring with other people all the time. He said constantly have it at hand. That's how I think about philosophy. And it's weird. For the last five years, every single day, I've been writing this free email about Stoic philosophy. It's been not just cool to meet all these fellow practitioners of Stoic philosophy, but in writing about it, talking about it, reading it for our podcast, I have got to internalize these ideas in a way that I never would have been able to under any other circumstances. That's the idea. Philosophy is something we're supposed to engage in, not keep in these dusty old books or read once and be done with. It's a constant process. And I think that's why the email has worked so well for the people reading about it and sharing it and talking about it, all of that as well. So I'd love to have you join us on this email. You can sign up at dailystoic.com slash daily email. It's totally free, no spam. You can unsubscribe whenever you want. I've basically given away a book for free every single year for five years, and I'm gonna keep on doing it until I drop dead. Check it out, dailystoic.com slash daily email. So let's talk about these soft skills for a second, because you know, like I think a lot of people's impression of you is like ambitious Gary, hustler Gary, yes. grind Gary. Yes. Um, you know, and now you're talking about empathy and kindness. And, and I, I get a little bit of this on my stuff. People are like, what are you woke now? What are you politically <laughs> correct? Yeah. Because you're saying that you should care about people. What is that? That's the climate we're in. You know, I do a lot of, you know, it was funny. We were talking about you uh, in the car and we we're just talking about how much you read. And I was like, you know, it's funny. He reads books the way I read comments and like it's all information gathering. And I've been doing a ton of homework on the late 60s just to give me pattern recognition of how I want to navigate this era, because we're clearly there. It's all the same shit, wildly different, same shit. Um, and, you know, I think this is what happens. People are on emotional tilt. 
I'm empathetic to those realities. I'm not overtly worried about that. You know, I I feel like I've this is in a, like this has been pretty in my content if people what, looked for it. What I mean is like what's this aversion to people saying you should oh, be know, kind to people? I know it's, what you're it's saying. It's crazy. It's because people think that it's um it's grounded in people politicizing everything. If you've decided your framework on society is everything is a political issue, yeah. you're gonna try very hard to figure out what is it? Is yeah. it red or blue? Actually, it's really funny, my team's been hearing this. I've been really having this weird feeling about purple. The color purple? Yep. Okay. And not the movie, though. That was remarkable. <laughs> I'm just very hot on how simplistic what I'm trying to tell the world is through business and really life, which is purple's awesome. Like if you're fully blue or if you're fully red, you're wildly vulnerable. You mean a mix of both is what you're saying? Yes. Yeah. Like that if I was born in this country, I'd probably, and very aware of how impossible it is to win a presidential election through being an independent, the Ross Perot gave it a real fucking run. And I think I'm way more charismatic than Ross. Uh, you know, he ran with a stoic, Admiral Stockdale. I did not know that, but I'm excited to hear that. It makes even more sense now that I'm a stoic. And so uh, I think there's something very real about purple. I live it in business. When people, you know, it's funny, a couple of my friends, acquaintances, they're like, oh, I'm like, this is not coddling. Yeah. Like, and first of all, I'll fucking kill you. Like, you know, like, it's like kind of like, this is sharp elbow. Like, I actually genuinely believe that leadership done this way makes you more money. Yeah. Like, this is not like, I'm not here for like, let's, like, Vayner Media's code word internally is let's build a honey empire. Honey over vinegar. Empire is not a soft word. I'm not fucking giving eighth place trophies. There's incredible amounts of things in blue land that I'm like, eh. I don't want to give eighth place trophies. Yeah. Like, but the reality is, is that I know this is real. I'm comfortable with people's reactions to it. I'm aware that people knew me as Wine Gary for f seven years, and there was no other Gary. You know, the, I am aware that I had friends that told me after I sold Resi and had some big IPOs that I was crazy to do garage sale videos because it was gonna make me seem not elevated. Right. I'm aware that now a lot of people think of me as Gary V with, in the NFT space. Sure. I'm gonna be known for a lot of shit. But don't you think, like sports <clears throat> have figured this out, right? That it's like, oh, maybe there's other ways to win than screaming at people and using them up as these sort of expendable, re like suddenly they're caring about culture and they're caring about load management and sleep and all the, like, to me, it makes perfect sense that the things you're talking about would come to business and all elements of life because this sort of brutal, you talk about this at the beginning of the book, like the dog eat dog, like I'm gonna destroy you, zero sum mindset for business and life and sport. It does, it's, not only is it not the only way to do things, it, when talent has leverage, it's the worst way to do things. 100%. As a matter of fact, taking from sports, there's something else that I think I wanna make a compelling conversation for that I hope evolves. In sports, even though it drives me crazy as a diehard, the Jets play the Bills this week. They're our rival. They've been bad for a long time. They finally got their shit together. They're beating our faces in. I want to kill everybody because I'm irrational in sports land. Sure. And the game ends and they're hugging. Yeah. Or they're swapping jerseys before the game. And now that I'm in the business representing players, it's actually more beautiful than you think. They're catching up with friends and asking them to support their non-prot. Like, if you put Mike some of the talks there, the perception versus the reality is staggering. Because it benefits them in the off season. Because then they can go text guys, hey, you gotta come here. Plus, this is a good place course, to play. Of course, and like, and they think about life after football now. All these kids wanna be entrepreneurs. They're all done at 35, right. except for a couple characters in Tampa, these guys wrap up at 35 and they do their thing and they do business with their, we don't have that in business. I, I compete with people directly that I actually genuinely like and I try to have relationships with them and they could be less interested because they've made the business thing the entire encompassing. So in sports, you can beat the fuck out of each other but then hug it out. Yeah. But in business, if I beat you in a pitch for the 
Pepsi business, you are, you hate me forever. And I see you at banquets at South by at can and you're mean to me and you talk shit like, and that's everybody. And that's crazy. I had uh, RC Buford on the GM of the, the Spurs did the whole, the Spurs dynasty. They have a alumni locker room at their practice facility. And I was thinking about how amazing that is. Like after these guys have finished playing, they can live anywhere in the world. What does it say about your culture that they continue to, to live in San Antonio by choice, first and foremost, and then they Big come- Big shout out to San Antonio, but like there's other no, places. You know what, I, I don't yeah. think that's an insult to San it's Antonio. Not, it's not. And, and then they come in to work for free just to hang out, right? Like that's what, that's what I think thinking about some of these things gets you. It gets you a culture that sustains itself that you don't have to continue let's, to enforce by force. Let's go again to things that may not seem as obvious. I agree. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. A thing that I think some people kind of know, but they don't think in 30 year terms. Fine. Let me give you one that I don't think people think about. If your office is not political, people go faster. Let's just, let's go there. What, what, what have I observed? My companies are fast. Speed, like in sports, matters in business. Sure. In a real way. First to market. In a second, real way. Yeah. Pivot quickly. Like when you eliminate fear, you can go fast. When people aren't overthinking every word in every meeting because, oh, wait a minute, Carl Munn, I locked that and now he's gonna write me, like. And you don't just mean like politics, like elections, you mean politics just uh, like in bullshit, office. Yeah, bureaucracy, op- yeah. You, every company on earth. Yes. Like you walk, and we have, listen, we have it good, but it's human. Sure. You can't, new people are coming in every day. You can't catch them all. It's not Pokemon. You know, and so like, you know, I think what is happening is what I've noticed is we're winning because people are less scared because we're really focused on these things. It really, really matters. And, but it matters in like funny ways. It's like, um, and then also like, you know, to, like this is where, what I really get excited about is when I look at them like this and I go, you know, it's funny, conviction with humility is a concoction that gets interesting, right? Because you can't separate them. They, they enhance each other. Correct. Yeah. So when I started thinking about them as ingredients, I was like, huh, you know, like, you know, accountability is really fascinating. And of course, accountability works well with conviction and tenacity. And this is like me, the misunderstandings, right? I can go hard, but if I lose, like, I'll be the first to like put out ungodly amounts of content in seven years being like, guys, I, I missed it. I don't know why NFT, like I thought NFT, like I actually like that. Sure. Like I at nausea have talked about passing on Uber cause I enjoy it. Cause I enjoy my losses, right? I, so I think that gets into stuff. And then obviously kind of the elephant in the room that real talk about really not knowing me just through my content. When, when everybody that got like previews of this or got a little wind of it, were like, Candor's your weakness, and they're right. Gary V, like in this setting, yeah, yeah, Mike, like Gary V is a fucking dominant force of candor. No, it's the emphasis on the first part. It was Gary Vaynerchuk struggled mightily. A, I am fearful of. It, here's actually talk about something that's powerful. My greatest fear was to create fear in my companies. I hate fear. You don't want a culture of fear in the business, and that's what I think. Everybody does. Yeah. And I didn't want to rule by fear because I know it's Only powerful. Only the paranoid survive. And my dad ruled yeah. by fear. So I became very visceral to it. Um, when I had to wake up four or five years ago and finally the subconscious became the conscious and I realized that my lack of candor actually was creating a ton of fear at VaynerMedia because people didn't know where they stood and you would have... I you were would, telling people what they wanted to hear. You were... You were Avoiding yes, things. That's right. No, I think I, I was massaging. Ahead. I was trying to coach it through in a different way. I would. I didn't care about money. It also so, creates politics, right? Because people are like, "We're not getting the truth. We got to do this." Correct. Side action. Correct. Stuff. And more importantly, pandering to me because I'm the ruler, right? And so, when I really had that, that was a really dark moment for me in my career because when you realize the thing you most didn't want to do was happening, and so then I had to market to myself. I was like, candor doesn't work for me and literally chipped away at it. And when the word kind went in front of it, it's been wild. And by the way, the last 18, 24 months where my game has gone from a 10 out of 100 to call it maybe I'm a 60 out of 100 right now, that 50 
has been monumental in my business success. Interesting. And so that motivated me to say, fuck, I can't believe how much of an impact this is having because I had a lot of things going for me. But man, just this one, what happens if I actually get people to truly just deploy accountability? Because everybody that is listening right now has worked with somebody who just blames people for everything. It just is the way it is. And like, if you make that change, everybody around you will adjust very quickly, right? right? Um, patience, I've come to learn, was so easy for me and is like impossible for everybody. Mainly, this is how I got down the path, mainly because I didn't realize how many people valued other people's opinions. So of course you wanna be successful at 25, you wanna show your mom, you wanna show your friends, you wanna show the world. Of course you're lacking patience. You want a BMW, you want a Rolex, you want a blue check mark, you want a million followers, you want to be an entrepreneur, and all this bad behavior happened in the last decade because of it. Well, I think it's important to point out how they interrelate with each other, because this is, so when people hear accountability or humility or candor, in isolation, they're okay, but you can, they can also turn into problems, right? So for the Stoics, when we're talking courage, temperance, justice, wisdom, courage for an unjust cause or a stupid cause right? Doesn't work. Patience for something. That isn't not, working. If you're not holding yourself accountable to the patience or you're, you're not being empathetic, they all interrelate to each other. Can I ask you a question? Other. What about this one? Because this one is I, number two. Gratitude? No, gratitude oh, is my fucking everything. Yes. Gratitude is number one on this list and back for a reason. Yeah. Every day's good. Of course. You're alive. You're alive. Nobody died. You're a black swan of black swans. We should not exist. 800, that's right, 400 trillion to one. Yeah. 850 million people on earth do not have access to clean water. The fuck am I upset about this meeting getting canceled? And, and how, how much would you have killed to be in the position you are in right now and taking for granted, right? Oh. Like we would be, the Stoics talk about how if we lost what we have, we would be devastated. And if we saw someone else with what we have, five years earlier, we'd be insanely jealous of them. And then we'd sit around going like, un being unhappy with what we have. It's insane. Yeah, to, so no, but number- Self-awareness. Yeah, self-awareness. So this is the one that I'm passionate about. Like for me, so much has worked for me because I understand myself in space. Strengths, right? weaknesses, et cetera. Yeah, it, and also when you deploy empathy with self-awareness. By the way, being Gary V is all based on this. Like, I'm aware why somebody be like, fuck this dude. I'm empathetic to that. I get all of it. It makes it palpable. To me, this is why ego is so dangerous, right? You can't make stuff for other people, whether it's art or products. Like, when you think about Kanye West or Steve Jobs, we think of them as egotistical people. Not at all. They couldn't have been while they were making Incredibly stuff. Incredibly not true. Because it was rooted not just in empathy for other people, but an understanding of what, where... A hundred percent. They're reverse engineering the consumer. Yeah. It has to come They from may them. be audacious. They may be aggressive. They may be... They Listen, I do it. They may enjoy the communication of what they're up to in your face. But Muhammad Ali and Babe Ruth did the same thing and people were mad at them until they weren't. Right. Like, like it's not super complicated. Like, if you're good enough to call your shots... So how do you cultivate self-awareness then? That's the, that's the paradox. Well, what was funny about this book, and I appreciate you reading it, you saw I actually took a real stab at it. Like I really sat there and said, okay, great. I can put these 13 things down and what? Enjoy yourself, right? So yep. I did these exercises. I, I really tried to create this thing that I've replicated because it's been asked of me a lot through the years. And the game I won with some people, more inner circle, occasional fans, is sit down three to four people that are closest to you in the world have a kumbaya for two hours and eliminate all fear from them on giving you the truth and then create an anonymous structure for them to tell you your strengths and weaknesses and then whatever, fe like w once you start playing with that, whatever is uh, resonating or not resonating, you start double clicking into, right? You start yeah. challenging yourself to be uncomfortable. Like, like to me, uh, can I actually, I'm gonna go very vulnerable here. The candor thing happened very simply. I went in, saw an interaction between two former employees on some social network, and they didn't like me. And I loved them. And I went to bat for them for a long time, and I entitled them. I overcoddled them because I wasn't able to give them feedback. And then I got to my wits end, and I fired them. 
and I'm the bad guy. And I sat there and I said, I am a man who long ago became fulfilled financially. Fucking $100,000. That was it. It all changed after that. Not another time in my life has anything felt like anything. It was all extra from there? All extra from that little of a number. Okay? That must be very nice. It's incredibly nice. That's yeah. why I've been so happy. Yeah. I'm a man that's not motivated by that. I care about how many people show up to my funeral. I've got all these things going on. I'm talking all these things. And why are these two wonderful people who had plenty of love for me at one point, why are they sitting here having a convo shitting on me? I'm like, it's, I'm doing, I, I pushed myself further. I'm like, I've got a flaw and I'm gonna fucking fix it. And I knew what it was, but I didn't, couldn't like get it to your, you know how you can't get it to your fucking tongue? I'm like, it's fucking candor. Fuck. And then I started going down, why do I hate it so much? And I go into, my mom doesn't have it, she's my hero, she raised me. Then I look, my dad has it, but the way he delivered it was so negative. Everybody hated my dad that worked for him. You overcompensated. I, I overcompensated. Like I've come to learn that when something's over here, you want to go in the middle, not over. Like, but I went, I fucking went. That's what temperance is. The, the perfect respect. Yeah. So I didn't have the right temperance on it and it became my half and I'm excited to talk about it. And it's so crazy because it is my strength as a public figure. I love your no bullshit. Like it's like, it's all I get. And it's because the context of the setting speaking right. into the ether piece Easier. of cake. Speaking to Sally, who I know like has a sick kid, fuck me. Right. And the over empathy and over, comp, you know, compassion and the over sympathy, which are nice things. I went too far. I couldn't find my temperance. You know. No, that makes sense. I'm in this writers group, uh, like James Clear, Mark Manson. We get together once a year. We sit around. And all, everyone gets to talk. We, we all take turns. We get to talk about the person as if they're not in the room. Mm. And they can't say anything. All they can do is take notes. And it's super powerful because you get to see how people you actually care about, not just random people on the internet or whatever, and it, and it's think candor, about and you and you your work. Do you feel like everyone's caught good candor? Yeah, yeah. Good. And and but because they are in the room, you're still going to be kind, correct. right? And so And you can't go all the way there. Right, but you can you can plant the seed of what they can take back and go, "You know what? They're right. I am doing too much of this or not enough of this or why am I being held back here?" And then you take that back and you work on it. You it's ironic because we're talking about self-awareness, but one of the best ways to get it is from other people. I would say a spouse being the primary way because they know you better than anyone and uh, they can also speak to you the most directly. I think that it is just a big goddamn deal and all of this is, and it's really time that we actually talk about it as, like, like the alternate title to this is the soft skills are hard. Ooh, that'd be a good title. Thank you. You know, and so that to me is what, um, right, because it's a double cut, right? Oh, fuck. Anyway, I, uh, I'm just ready for this because I know it to be true. I know it to be true. Of course you can build an empire by not being nice. I, a lot of them are that way. Of course. Right. <laughs> but if you're on the other side of reading it, wouldn't it be nice to enjoy it? Like, have you met the 70 year old Titans that did it the other way? Nobody They're disliked. suffers more They're than disli that person. That person's fucking life blows. Like, I love that you put these people on a pedestal. They're not happy. They're not as happy as you think. Like, for real. Yeah. No, no. It's, uh, you would, if you actually knew what it was like in their head, you would not trade places with them for all the money in the world. It's why I always get crazy about that. I'd rather cry in my Ferrari than, but like, how about not crying? Yeah. How about smiling in your fucking whatever? Yeah. Ford. Or you're jealous of this person who's traveling on a private jet to some exotic, what, what if you had a life that you didn't need to run away from? Right. Like, like, what are we talking about? Like, yeah. All right, a couple more quick riffs. Marcus Aurelius says, uh, strict with yourself, tolerant with others. How do you like that? A lot. Yeah? Yes. I would actually argue that that's where I need to find a little bit of balance. My strictness with me is such a healthy one, and my tolerance with others may be too extreme, back to lack of candor. I'm trying to get a little Coddling. Bit better. Coddling, entitlement. Um, but my strictness with me is really cool. Uh, it's not like I eat at five or wake up. At, it's, it's this ability to not compromise on a couple of things. And the biggest one is kindness. 
Yeah. Or it's like, if you're driven and ambitious, you work 15 hours a day. It can be really easy to just expect that from other people. One of my favorite videos, you're talking to someone, they're like, you're like, the other people, they're not owners of the business. Yeah. You can't expect it's, what you expect absurd. of yourself of them. It's absurd. I, I once said to somebody, I'm like, you're talking as if we're talking about slavery. Yeah. Like the fuck are you talking about? Um, yeah, my I have zero expectations of others. If I'm being really honest, I take that way. It you're always pleasantly surprised. Kind, yeah, <laughs> like, and I'm accountable. It's like, look, I mean, yeah, I I love that, and I'm a believer of it. Yeah, and look, it's called self discipline, right? Not not you know nothing else. I've been it's thinking a lot about why people point fingers, why people have fallen in love with judgment of others. And I've come to realize it's because they're practicing on themselves. You know, my inability to overjudge myself is exactly why I don't judge others. We're, we're holding ourselves up to, we're the judge and jury and we're putting ourselves into jails. Right. Right. Like it's nice yeah. to have asper. I mean, I'm ambitious as fuck. Sure. It's nice to have standards. I'm not saying that. But like this notion of beating yourself up when you fall short on something that is a standard or an ambition is incredibly unhealthy. Well, it's like you would never talk to someone else the way that you talk to yourself. But what's funny is mine is actually slightly twisted on that. I talk to everybody the way I talk to myself, which is why I talk so nicely to everybody. But that's how you want it, right? But mo a lot of people talk to themselves in a way that they would never tolerate. Correct, because to most else. people try to prop themselves up by tearing everybody else down. Right. All right. So, Mark Surrealist, again, uh, the best revenge, the best way to get even is to not be like them. My, I think there's something that I like that. Uh, my version on revenge is a little bit more like the inability to even care about their action, to so shrug it off. In, in a more audacious way. Okay. Not only shrug it off, recognize that you're about to actually stick it to them by not even acknowledging it happened. It's, it's an extreme version of cutting them out of your ecosystem. Sure. That's how I've dealt with like people that have done really not nice things or trying to go, like it's almost as if it didn't happen. Yes. It like goes on this nice little shelf. I'm like, that's nice. You can play with yourself in that cocoon of like whatever you feel about me. You've now become a energy that is just like not a good use of time. And even giving it time. And to be frank, I've evolved a little bit from that. I'm now receiving that energy and kind of deploying really deep sympathy. The thought at this point in my life that you want to spend any of your time hurting somebody else's feelings seems outrageously foreign and really just makes me feel compassionate. The ultimate person who suffers from it is them. A hundred, all that we're doing out here is, exp somebody said something to me yesterday, I did something kind of cool, giving away some stuff, and, and, and they were like kind of asking, I was like late, I was getting home, I was just replying, I'm like, it's just because I have so much love to give. I don't know what to do with it all. That's sweet. And I really think that that's, that a lot of people live the reverse. They have so much pain. They're trying to get it out. You know, for me, it's an abundance of love. I'm like, fuck it. Like, I don't want to, like, what am I going to, like, this is like, I better do stuff. Right. Um, I think that's how hate works. All right. So I think anyone who talks about stuff publicly, let alone puts out a book like this and then mine, I think the, the tricky part is, it's easy to talk about, it's hard to do, yes. right? Epictetus says, don't talk about your philosophy, embody it, yes. or don't talk about it, be about it. Sometimes I wonder like, if I'd never written about it, but I believed it, could I get convicted of these things in court, right? Like if somebody didn't know who I was, they just bumped into me on the street, how close am I actually to the things I write and talk about? How, how's that journey for you? Uncomfortably remarkable. Okay. <laughs> Um, I would say that I understate me. I understate the things I live. Okay. I really believe that. How do you get there? Well, I get there by doing it. Sure. I'm doing it. Yeah. And I get there by understating it. <laughs> like I, 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 look, I have Andy and D-Rock here behind the cameras. 
you know, I'm st- they'll probably agree with me. I'm starting to actually, this book and a lot of others, like the last two years, I would say that I'm starting to peel away my curtain a little bit more and show this stuff more. Um, Cause it's hard to talk about this stuff. It's like, hey, I'm humble. Yeah. The fuck is that content? Sure. So you gotta find your balance cause that's not nice. Um, but to answer your question, the thing that I've always loved is I'm more about the things I talk about and I talk about them at scale. But earlier you were saying kind candor that you were a 10 before, now you're a 60. So you're still at a D, right? So you're still, you're still moving yeah, up, but, right? but I also, this book's also not called 13. No, that's a good point. So you right? feel like- so you Like feel, the book, like yeah, the yeah, book sure. is like, I stink at this. Yeah. Yeah, like I don't want, listen, uh, he worked for somebody that used to work for me. I don't want him to know one story from Sam that undermines Gary Vee. I have never wanted, I live very loose. I have admins that have access to everything. My team has, these guys have access to everything. I have no interest in letting any other human being ever have leverage on me. The thought of saying one thing and doing another to then worry if I can control them to never say it is fucking asinine. Sure, but I don't know, kindness, it's easy to say, and then someone does something cruel. To, right? Like, we have these instantaneous reactions to things. You find, you're, you have to check yourself. I, I, you, you know, we got to this it. a little bit in this talk, and it's, I'm starting to, like, this is starting to come top of mind for me. I would, do you know how many words I could have put in this book? This didn't have to be these 13 traits. Sure, There's sure. a lot of other shit. These are ones that I live. Like, this is, like, you know, these are the ones I live, and the ones that I notice, and I can see them, and... Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I don't feel vulnerable. It's good. No, 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 that's I, great. I think I probably somewhere in hindsight realized 15 years ago, oh, I'm going for it, right? Yeah. And when I realized that, I probably, you know what I had a good read on? That the internet was gonna expose everything. Like a very good read. Like I talked about it back then. Like in Wine Library TV, like I would reference it. And I think by knowing that, and by knowing I was gonna go for it, I must have become a much better version of myself on all these things because I was like, I don't want the vulnerability. But it's something you're, you, you worked on and are working on. These are the ideals and you're aspiring to get there day to day, right? It's not just- Yes, but I'd be not authentic if I didn't say that for the 12 of them, they come uncomfortably easy to me, always have and are foundational and why I think have outsized results. I'm really g- proud of myself because I don't think I could have made, that. this book would have been called 12 seven years ago. Uh, you wouldn't have admitted the half. I grew up in a family where complaining was the single worst thing anyone could do. Sure. Because we came from the old country and mom and dad had to go outside for a toilet and didn't have bread. So what the fuck are you upset that your Nintendo's sure. not working? Sure. So I, we demonized complaining in my family. Somehow I feel like that bled into not being or talking about vulnerabilities. Sure. And so I don't think seven years ago I could have talked about the vulnerability of candor the way I did here. And I, to your point, I aspire to be more vulnerable over the next 40 years, which I think will push me into new places. I love that. All right, so last thing, because last time we talked, it went a little bit viral. We talked about your favorite three words, you're gonna die. Yes. Or as, as the Stokes say, memento mori. To me, that ties into gratitude, right? Not just look at what you have, but the fact that you're still alive. It's huge. Every day, Seneca says, if you go to bed at night and you go, I've died, it's the end of my life. When you wake up in the morning, it's all gravy it's from there. That's really how I think. <laughs> Bro, I, I had a recurring dream 20 times a year, not like two, from third to eighth grade that my family decided to go back to Russia for a family vacation and the plane goes down, of course in Siberia, straight out of Rocky. And every time I survived, but the two other family members were always random. Okay. I once prayed on my porch when I was in seventh grade for 20 minutes because I thought my mom died in a car accident because I was watching my brother and sister and she was an hour late and they didn't have cell phones back then. And what happened was there was an accident. She was just in traffic. Yeah. My relationship with the depths of only caring about the health and well-being of seven, 10, 12, 15 people, there is nothing else. The reason this is all so fucking easy for me, all of it, all of it, is because there is nothing else. Right. For real, for fucking real. 
I know that it might not land for people. I confuse the fuck out of people. But you want to buy the Jets? I'm like, no, no. I want to try to buy the Jets. I love my process. But, but the, you, the, yes, like it's my art. Like I love being an entrepreneur. It's fun. It's my game. I love entrepreneurship and everything that you see that I'm doing, the way people like golf. Sure. The way people like sailing. The way people like skiing. The, the seriousness that I take it with is so non-existent. Of course I can deal with so much. It's not pressure. My dad and sister, I love them, but they, they have their, my, dad, my sister's in real estate, my dad is the wine store. Their most stressful thing once a week is like something that happens to me 974 times a day without it even hitting my radar. That's not to say I'm great and they're not. That says to me, I can see like how people see the world differently. And what a fucking blessing to me that our two biggest clients calling tomorrow and firing us would be like a, and I'd be like, mm, you know, and it, it would be, but like, but not really. Yeah, I mean, and if you're playing with house money, so, okay, so you said you got, you, you had to give some of it back, but it's not yours I've anyway. Al- I've also been a little bit even, like I've had my own little weirdness on this. Not only is it house money, and I've talked about this in nausea, I am like romantic of the concept of losing it all and building it back up. It won't happen because I'm too conservative, Again, another thing that doesn't seem obvious, like I'm too thoughtful, but like. You like the narrative of potentially being able to do that. You know what I would like the most? I love being an athlete. I love, you know, when I watched Trey Young be the villain in Madison Square Garden against my Knicks, I had a very funny thing with it. They were my Knicks, they finally are back, we're in the playoffs, and I'm watching Trey and I'm like, every chemical, chemical, like things you can't control in my body is, I understand this and I want this. Like I want all of Madison Square Garden booing me because the feeling, like it's why I love Novak Djokovic. I don't like feds, I don't like Rafa, I like Novak. Why? Because Novak plays in center court against Rafa or fed, normally fed in Wimbledon. The whole stadium, the whole country, the whole world is rooting for Roger and when, when Novak sometimes hits like a shot that's improbable in a big spot and he just stops and just looks at everybody, that's the apex for me. Because that's competitiveness at its finest. I understand it, I fucking live for it. And so like, this is why I fear eighth, like this is why purple, right? Like competition is fun. I'm, by the way, let there, that's this very important point. I don't want you to be all hurt by my winning. I just want to win. Right. It's, people don't understand. It's, it's a winner mentality, winner takes all thing, but not at actual expense. This is what I love about business. You Because it's not zero it's sum. It's not. Yeah. Like, VaynerMedia is fucking on fire, but guess what? 8,000 other agencies are crushing. This is something I have to talk to authors about. No book is stealing not a one. space from not someone. Not one. It's like, it, if people are reading, we're all I winning. I get pumped when people... And it's I've gotten to the extreme version where now... By the way, when I heard you sold 1.2 million copies yeah, of this, I was like, me. yeah, I was like, fuck yeah, because that's incredible. That means that that is humanly possible to do for a book that doesn't have Trump in the title, yes. you know, and that it's positive and that isn't also isn't written by Matthew McConaughey or something. Correct. Right? That's incredible. And Matthew didn't sell 1.2 million books. No, he didn't. And so, sorry, Matt, I know he's <laughs> that's, the, here. that's the competition. Of course. And by the way, that's not like anything like I fucking love Matthew. I, I could. When he reached out, and can I do your podcast? Couldn't wait. I want to put everybody, I'm in a very weird place now. I'm a more extreme version of myself, maturity, like advancement. I fucking want everybody to win. Why not? Of course. Fuck, why not? I promise you, if you're listening right now and you think somebody else's winnings are coming out of your pocket, You've lost before you start. I promise you with all my fucking heart. You better get into therapy. You better start listening to other shit. I'm telling you right now, if that's you, you need to fucking really reframe this conversation. It is the fakest thing in the world. It's the boogeyman. And it's also, unfortunately, the trait that is actually limiting you. A yeah, great expression. I think I like this. Envy is the only sin that's not any fun. <laughs> right? It punishes you. It sucks. No one is having less fun than the jealous person. It, it's a poison. Jealousy and envy really scares me. It comes from the deepest depths of insecurity. And you know, when I was growing up and I saw my friends being jealous with like their girlfriends, it was just like, 
like clean data, I'm like, you're just insecure. I've seen it in business. It's just, it's insecurity at scale. And it needs to be addressed because it's not good. Right. It's just not. Okay, so last, last part of this. What is, how does, because I love when you say this and I think about it too, but there is a tension between life is short, memento more, you could go at any moment, and one of the best long. piece of advice you give people, which is you've got so much time. So much. So what's the tension? How do you, how do you balance out? Easy. Life is Ready? short, you got time. If you think life is long, it helps you in so many ways. If you happen to die suddenly, you wouldn't have known anyway. Okay. Sure. It's the end of your problems. Right. People are like, no, Gary, life is short. I'm like, good news. It's over anyway. Yeah. Like if a tree falls on my head when I walk out of here, I'm not going to know. Right. You know, maybe I'll be up in heaven and be like, mother, I should have never went to Ryan's store. That was so stupid. We could have done it on Zoom on last Tuesday. Yeah. I would have had 40 more years. Will the Jets ever win a Super Bowl without me? You know, it would, that would be what was going on in heaven, right? Like, so my thing is, my concept is practical. Life is long and you believe it, you get more patient, more thoughtful, happier, and life is good. If you're right, that life is short, well, when you die out of nowhere, you're not gonna know anyway, so what the fuck are we talking about? And, and this whole concept that life is short leads to like you living your best life is the greatest joke of all time. Every person that I know that is like deeply believes that is frantic and doing all sorts of weird shit. It's not like the life is short crowd is in fucking Maui or like, you know, chilling and fucking lobster catching and because they love like the life is short crowd is completely out of fucking control and doing crazy ass shit. They're far from happy. To me, it's life is short. So have a great self-contained day today where you did everything that you could today. And then you're grateful if you get tomorrow, but you're not putting anything off. You're also not. To me, okay. People, uh, Go ahead. I'm sorry because you got me excited. Like, I'm not talking about complacency out right. here. People are like, I'm talking about patience. People are really bad in taking a word and deciding it meant something else. When I say patience, I see people like thinking I'm talking about complacency and laziness. Or resignation or something. Right. I'm like, no, no, that's why those words exist. I'm talking about patience. Like, I, it's just unbelievable how nuanced these words are and how people decide them, but they decide them because they decided it before they even heard it. You've decided before you even heard it. The lack of openness, this no culture we live in, it's happening right now heavy with the NFT thing and it's just reminiscing for me for 05 and 95. Why can't you be in the maybe business? Why can you just say no to NFTs and you haven't done a single hour of homework? Right. Yeah, or just not have an opinion. Just be honest where it goes. Well, listen, now you're getting into something I'm really passionate about that I have like, I'm, I, God, I love you. Uh, no, this is fun for me. I actually have almost no opinions on, like, I think the no opinion is the superpower and I've come to realize that's me on almost everything. The amount of opinions I have is very limited. I just don't have a lot of bandwidth to like do but enough you're in on You're in with two feet on the stuff you do have an opinion about. And both hands. Yeah. Like I'm fucking all in on what I do. But, you know, everyone just feels like they need to, like, like I, the rare occasion that somebody asks me a left field question on stage where I get to say I don't know is my favorite. It happens only, unfortunately, once every two years because people stay in the pocket. But some guy asked me about some Stephen Hawking shit and I was like, I don't know. And the react, um, remember the Steve Rock was like three, four years, it's been a while, COVID, but I loved it because I speak with such conviction and passion that it threw everybody off and I was like, kind of almost like spoke to them like, I don't know about most things. I just stay in a very narrow lane where I have massive affirmation. I think that's why I'm freaking out about this. But that's where humility comes in, right? I think Ego so. says like, I'll just pull an answer out of my ass, right? I can't look weak. I can't say I don't know. It takes some humility to be like, I literally don't know what any of the things you just said are. And my humility is gaining some momentum. I was in a meeting right before COVID. I was really proud of myself. I'm like, okay, I'm taking the next step. We're in a marketing, marketing, marketing meeting and somebody used some acronym. I had no idea what it was. And I was like, hey, what was PLC? Yeah. And it was something I should have known. And I was fucking fired up. <laughs> because before, I'm such a quick read. For the majority of my career, I would... It was not like I'm like would pontificate on it, but I wouldn't stop because I knew that I could figure it out if I Take could it listen. Take it till you make it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it, but it wasn't 
fake it to, right. like I wasn't faking it. You'll pick it up. You'll figure I'll it out. Pick it yeah. up. Yeah. It was more that honestly. If they then said, "What do you think?" I would bail. I would, yeah. like, <laughs> because again, I never. I truly believe this. I'm petrified of being historically incorrect because I think it's my leverage. And you know, now my career is in a funny spot where like I always felt it. Now I think a lot more people feel it. You know, there's a lot, there's enough wins on the board now where I'm starting to gain momentum on something that is business leverage. Um, so I, I don't want to fake it till I make it. Like I really don't. And I think a lot of people believe that works. And well, the I stakes of being wrong, the stakes are higher on being wrong. If, and, if, and you just don't, you don't want to be out to, you don't want to be caught. On competition, yeah. not on money. Yeah, right. People are wrong all the time. Reboot, money, money, money. I don't care. I want the legacy. I want the statue at the stadium when I'm done. Not There's a lot of people with three Super Bowl rings, but there's only so many people that have a statue outside of their stadium. I want a statue in entrepreneurship. I want a statue. And I don't think you get a statue by making the most money. No. I think you get a statue by the 360 thing that I'm talking about. Yeah, it's impact, relationships, yes. uh, work you've you gotta, do. But by the way, you've got to put up the things. I can't be considered one of the greatest entrepreneurs of all time if I don't put up a real meaningful yeah. resume. Right. right. Um, but I think if I nail this narrative for the next decade, I think I can have one of the biggest impacts on entrepreneurship. I have a lot of people listening to me at very young ages and the, the reframing of what it takes to win. And people, look, we all did it. I did it, we all did it. You look up to something, I'm incredibly aware of what's going on with my TikTok following. I'm incredibly aware of what's going on. And if I can land that, I'm excited. Well, it's like, it's not just how many Super Bowls a coach Am I missing wins. my thing? Do you have to go? Uh, it's 8.44. Did I miss it? Yep, I sure did. I'm out of here. I have like a live Twitter spaces. Get out of here. I kind of Get out trusted of here, myself. But this is accountability. It's my fault. Here we go. Uh, 